Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it is time for all of the real fans' favorite part of the week, the Q&As. So let's go ahead and get this started. Alright, first question. Why does a straight bar underhand chin-up cause so many elbow slash wrist issues and what steps can be taken to prevent it? I've been doing neutral grip for a while, but I want to get back into chin-ups and get to 20 consecutive reps. All right, I think that's a good goal. Actually, that's a great baseline fitness goal, I think, is for anyone to be able to do 20 consecutive chin-ups. That's uh, particularly for men. For women, it's closer to 8 to 10. But for men to be able to do 20 is kind of a really big fitness benchmark. So I'm glad you're trying to reach for something like that. Uh, I do want to point out when you talk about the underhand grip chin-up, that's all chin-ups are basically underhand grip. The supinated position of the hand is what defines an actual chin-up versus a pull-up. So the other you're talking about more neutral grip pull-ups. As far as uh, that goes, for a lot of people, the reason you experience a lot of actual elbow pain or uh, wrist pain, but generally elbow pain on it is because guys are trying to grip a little too wide for their personal anatomy. Due to some people's shoulder structure and everything else, they need to grip a little narrower on the chin up to avoid that happening. And for others, it can also just be an overuse issue. It could be inflammation of the connective tissue from simply doing more of them than your body is able to adapt to and handle. Maybe you've increased your volume too quickly on the exercise and you're not giving yourself enough recovery time. Because you do need to realize a chin-up, even a bodyweight chin-up, puts a tremendous amount of stress on the bicep. And particularly if you end up stretching that tendon due to a really wide grip, you're putting a lot of stress on that bicep tendon. You're actually putting more total stress on it than you're capable of doing with curls due to your body weight. So uh, not only does it have a positive adaptive response, it is also very possible to cause overuse there. And it's something a lot of us don't think about with these body weight movements. We don't think of them as having the same effects. Uh, in terms of beating our bodies up, but you need to realize you're using your entire body weight and the biceps as a primary mover and a possible weak link in the exercise. So it can put a lot of stress on that tendon. So the best thing you can do is to go ahead and bring your grip in, uh, regulate your volume a little more, bring it down a little bit and increase it more slowly in the future. And if that doesn't help, some people are just, uh, due to their structure, can't do certain exercises with a great degree of intensity or volume without it causing a tendon and uh, inflammation issues. It's just your personal anatomy and you could be the rare individual in that group. And if that, that is you, after you try those other things, if it doesn't help, you may want to go back over to that neutral grip pull up because that is the next best thing to simulating the benefits of a chin up as far as the uh, arm development and everything goes. That is still a fantastic exercise and it is a great substitute if you can't do the chin ups without pain. So don't be worried if that's the case. It is 99% as effective uh, for the same goals, maybe 98%. So there's no reason that you shouldn't do that instead if it's really causing you problems. And good luck on your goal of getting 20 of them consecutively, depending on which one you end up having to go with either one is a great goal to strive towards all right next question hey jason i just completed your off-season linear periodization intermediate strength program god that is a mouthful i read that one really long <laughs> i've made some pretty decent gains my priorities have changed a little and i am now thinking about improving my body weight movements and we'll start doing uh, two days per week of high volume body weight exercises i still want to keep uh, making gains in the gym so will two days per week of full body training with one set per exercise using the same uh, progress you use be enough to do so i want to save most of my workload and feel fresh for the body weight movements any suggestions would be greatly appreciated p.s i also train muay thai five days per week and run about 20 kilometers per week cheers all right brother you have a very very lofty training load every week so for you yeah man i'm gonna say two days a week of actual weight training is probably all you want to do at this point and you're going to progress slowly because you're doing so much other stuff that your body is simply not going to be able to adapt anywhere near maximally to your weight training but that's okay if you finish my intermediate program you're probably pretty big and pretty strong already so just maintaining what you have will be fantastic and i think if you were to do do the uh, full body twice a week and maybe do some concurrent type training. Have a slightly uh, heavier day or a, and a lighter day to where you do more volume. But since you're doing so much other volume with other stuff, you could just make it a pure strength day and work around uh, 
you know, the four to six rep range a lot like I do and just do it two days a week with one set, uh, that will be perfectly acceptable and you may actually make some small gains while doing that. Uh, as far as your two days a week of the, the full body stuff doing high volume, that will work because that puts you with four days of real resistance training every week and considering that you do a pretty large amount of running and you do all that Muay Thai, that's going to be a lot. And that's okay though, that's why again doing uh, one work set training like I do, if you're only lifting, lifting twice a week will be fine for what you're doing because it leaves you so much extra recovery and adaptation ability towards all those other things you're doing because you're branching in a lot of directions. And I think for someone who's trying to do Muay Thai like you're doing, uh, you have to be versatile like that because again, Muay Thai five days a week and doing running and everything, you're going to need to be very, very versatile and that's okay. That's why abbreviated training like that is fantastic for people who want to be more athletic which clearly seems to be your overall goal so i think that'll be perfectly acceptable for what you're doing i like your plan i like the sound of it uh, so proceed as you have planned and adjust as needed all right next question you said that for an overeater we just have to accept that we will be hungry all the time do you ever have uh, physiological psychological advice on how to live with hunger Honestly, the best thing you can do for living with it is to find distractions and other things to keep you busy when you're hungry so that you wait longer to eat. That's one big thing. I mean, if you're bored and you're, again, like me, and I assume you are, you're genetically predisposed, and there's a lot of new data emerging on that showing that obesity has a massive leptin component and a genetic component because we just get hungry all the time and are never full, it, it can still be regulated with your lifestyle. You're going to have to find things to keep yourself busy. That helps a lot, and that's usually my biggest personal failing uh, when I fall off the wagon on my own diet. It has to do with the fact that I get bored, and since I'm hungry all the time and you're bored, you're going to want to eat, particularly if you're ravenously hungry all the time. So uh, finding things to keep you busy and distracted away from thinking about being hungry is a fantastic thing to do. Maybe go do some cardio or take a walk every time you get really, really hungry to stave it off a little longer. Number two, this is where diet adherence is a big deal. This is why there are so many diets that every person swears by that are so dramatically different. One person swears by a ketogenic diet, another a paleo, another a vegan diet, another ultra low fat, high fiber, clean bro diets. These diets, the one thing they all have in common is that they affect people's personal satiety differently. And so therefore, the secret is, of course, finding the diet or dietary approach that allows you to feel full. And this is why people who are chronic overeaters don't always do well, as well on the Fit Picture macros, because that diet and, and allowing extra treats in there might give you some psychological relief but what it doesn't do is give you a feeling of fullness and so it tends to leave you even hungrier than when you started so that's why a lot of people with voracious appetites really have to be very very careful of diets that allow treats at all trying to hit numbers because they'll just binge and overeat once they've got a taste of it uh, again due to just overwhelming hunger and eating high calorie foods that don't necessarily give you a feeling of satiety because that's the hardest part for those of us who are just genetically overeaters is that it's hard for us to feel full and we have to really put effort into food selection and choices that will actually make us feel like we've eaten something so that we will adhere to our diet so you have to be a little more careful in your choices so that's my two pieces of advice there. All right, next question. If someone walks for a couple of hours several times a week, does this count towards list cardio purely from a health standpoint? Sure, absolutely. If the reason you're doing the walks is purely to improve your overall health, uh, the evidence is overwhelming that that works. Is walking for an hour a couple times a week going to dramatically increase anyone's uh, maximum endurance capacity? No, absolutely not. That is such a low threshold of endurance for human capability that it's barely a blip on the radar. So it's not going to improve your conditioning really at all from an athletic perspective. But as far as health markers go, people who don't do any cardio or lists who do go walk two or three times a week for 30 minutes or more, their blood work and their blood health markers almost immediately improve. Their, their cholesterol improves, their blood pressure improves, everything improves dramatically in a fairly short period of time. So again, if you're doing it purely as a form of LIS, which again is low intensity steady state cardio from a health perspective only, it will absolutely make a tremendous difference if you don't do any form of cardio at all. That will actually make a world of difference and uh, the, the research and data overwhelmingly shows that. It's just not going to make you an amazingly well-conditioned athlete if that happens to be your goal. So as long as you're defining it in the goal of health, absolutely. 
All right, next question. Jason, it's pretty common for a lifter to achieve the vast majority of their mass gains in the first couple years of dedicated lifting. Actually, it might even be the first year. Uh, do strength gains work the same way? For someone like a power lifter, is there generally a precipitous drop off in the strength improvements after the first couple of years? Yes, absolutely, and the reason for that is uh, because you're only gaining neural efficiency at a certain point in motor unit learning, which can account for a lot of strength. Don't get me wrong. I don't want people to think that motor unit learning and uh, rate coding and everything doesn't massively affect maximum strength output because it does. It could make easily a 10% or larger difference in your strength. But if you factor in that if someone gained a enough muscle mass over the course of their first two years of training to squat, say 405 with fairly uh, sloppy form that needs technique work and motor unit improvement. Uh, they're not gonna gain much muscle after that drug free. I mean, you've gained 90% of the muscle you're gonna gain for the rest of your life at that point in the first couple of years if you've trained drug free without going on drugs of some type. So they've, they've gained 90% of their muscle. There is a direct measurable correlation between muscle fiber hypertrophy and force exertion. So they're only gonna gain maybe 10% more size over the next several years. That's only gonna be, again, another 40 pounds on the squat for a muscle gain. And if they brush up their technique and their motor unit learning, they're probably, if they focus on that a lot heavier and clean their technique up and clean it up, they're probably only gonna gain another 10 to 15% uh, strength increase on that lift. So you're talking about, again, at most, 15% of 400 is going to be 60 pounds, maybe another 40 pounds for muscle. That person is going to have to fight very, very hard if they've hit a 400 squat completely drug-free, say in two years to get to 500. That's going to be really probably the, the most they're going to hope for, and they're going to have to really bust their ass and train for it because at best 60 pounds of that is going to be neural efficiency and another 40 pounds of it is going to be uh, from muscle growth. But you can make gains beyond muscle growth in terms of, again, just uh, utilizing muscle fiber recruitment more efficiently and learning better technique to make the lift more efficient. So that's where most of their strength gains are gonna come from that point. Once that first couple of years of size gains are done, the majority of their strength increases beyond that are gonna to have to come from those things. And once you maximize those, you are gonna find it very, very difficult to add any additional strength beyond that. It's gonna come very slowly. It can be done, but again, it's gonna require a lot of coaching and a lot of hard work at that point. All right, next question. Hey Jason, does doing a static stretching routine prior to lifting decrease the chances of injury or pulling a muscle while lifting? Is there any evidence that static stretching could prevent injury or is this kind of a myth? I think this falls into the category of myth personally. Uh, we know that static stretching before lifting can reduce performance. That's been documented many times over the years. So it's generally advised that you do some sort of dynamic stretching routine if you want to stretch before you lift or even things like foam rolling, uh, which again, myofascial release to warm the muscles up, to warm connective tissue up. But uh, again, how much warming up is necessary for someone who is well conditioned and already trains completely full range of motion on all their exercises as a little warm up with the lifts first. How much of that you need at all for injury prevention is subject to debate. I personally am of the opinion of leaning in the lower direction. I don't really warm up very much, if at all, before I train. Uh, because again, I train everything with full range of motion. I've done a lot of pause training. I don't have weak links in my kinetic chain. I don't have points of torque to where I'm really, really weak at the normal weak points in the ranges of motion because of the way that I choose to train year round. I don't use partials. I don't do things like that for my heavy work for the most part. So I'm not at a high risk of injury compared to people who maybe utilize those things. People who do accommodating resistance, partial reps, a lot of stuff like that are going to be at a much higher risk of injury from not warming up. So the way that you train is going to make a tremendous difference in those things. And again, I found over the years, and even guys like Jamie Lewis uh, tend to agree with me, who is again, a world record holder in powerlifting, raw powerlifting himself, that if you need to warm up to prevent injuries, there's probably something wrong with your overall condition and the way that you train to begin with. It's something you need to address. There's something wrong with what you're doing if you need to warm up to prevent injury. You're, you're not completely in the shape that you think you're in. All right, next question. Every time I do dips, the center of my chest hurts. The sternum area, I admit dips have never been in my program for this reason, but I want to do them as you said. If an exercise feels awkward, you most likely have weaknesses. 
I can guarantee you my form is perfect. I am straight up and down so I can hit the triceps more. I've even used assistance weights thinking my body weight might be too much, but the pain is there no matter how light or how perfect my form is. Help. All right, this is one of the reasons I have a love-hate relationship with the dip. And, and the reason for that is because some people simply cannot perform the dip. It is one of the best overall movements for developing size and strength in the upper body. Hands down, one of the best movements ever created. It is amazing. However, a certain percentage of the population cannot perform this exercise safely. And a number of people over the years while doing weighted dips have actually fractured their sternum while doing it. So if you're feeling pain in your sternum and you can't make that go away, even while doing assisted dips, you might want to consider not doing them. However, another thing you might want to consider if you're doing them completely upright and get this, you might want to try the other method before you disregard the exercise. Try them with a forward lean so that it works more chest. Give that a try for a little while, and if your sternum continues to hurt in spite of that with a complete change in technique to the other style of dip, then I'm going to recommend that you just forego them. I know that normally if you're awkward at a lift, there's muscle imbalances that need to be addressed, but in this particular case, this is an exercise where it's not awkward, it's pain due to your anatomy possibly not allowing for this exercise to be safe for you. And in that case, you're going to have to just find something else, and that's okay. There's no point injuring yourself trying to address a, a possible strength weakness uh, when the whole point of addressing strength weaknesses is so that you can be more well-rounded and less chance of injuring yourself doing things in the real world. So, you know, no point in doing that. It's kind of uh, contradictory at that point. So if it, you make that change in technique and your sternum continues to hurt, you're probably going to need to forego doing dips, unfortunately. You're just not structurally built to do the exercise safely. All right, next question. I realize you aren't a big fan of knee wraps. That's an understatement. But I actually do compete in powerlifting and I'm looking to switch to raw with wraps. My best competition squat with sleeves is 116.5 pounds at 242 pounds and 650 with bare knees. No knee issues whatsoever. What tips would you have for someone looking to transition from squatting raw to raw with wraps? Well, I can't personally make this choice for you, but I am going to recommend that you at least weigh it out, which you may or may not have done. If you compete with wraps, and I don't know why they call it raw with wraps, we should just call it squatting with wraps because it's not even remotely raw anymore with the strength of knee wraps that exist. But you need to stand there and weigh that out. Is the potentially crippling lifetime injuries to your knees worth you changing categories that you compete in? I mean, does it mean that much to you personally? If the answer is yes, that it is your dream to be an amazing knee wrap squatter and go down in the record books and that that will make your life feel complete and you don't care what price you pay for it, then by all means proceed. That's your life. It's your body. That's your decision to make. You need to do what's going to make you feel fulfilled and happy as a person. You need to do what's going to make you feel fulfilled. Now, what I'm going to recommend if you go that route is to at least minimize the damage because you're not going to reduce it to zero. If you squat heavy with wraps regularly, you will damage your knees over time. That's pretty much unavoidable. What I'm going to recommend, though, is that you minimize that by squatting less often with the wraps. Because you're having to train a different strength curve, you're obviously going to have to practice sometimes with the wraps to prepare for a meet, particularly when you're peaking for a meet. But it doesn't mean that you need to wear them year round to train that strength that same strength curve. You can do plenty of raw squatting, obviously, even raw squatting with pauses. And then when you want to train the accommodating resistance from it, you can train with things like chains. You can adjust the chains that you hang off of a bar or even do band work in a way to give you most of the, the shift and accommodating resistance out of the very bottom of it. Like you can stack chains in a way to where they take most of the weight off, say up to 100 pounds off at the very bottom, and then a very steep strength curve to where it feels really close to raw again by the way you stack chains. There's, there's techniques you can use on that. You can do a lot of chain work to simulate the strength curve somewhat closely of what you're going to get from really aggressive knee wraps without actually having to use the wraps as much in training so that you can have less damage on your knees, less wear and tear from the wraps while actually training the strength curve fairly closely to what you, would happen with the wraps in competition and then just start wrapping up more as you're peaking for a meet. Therefore, you can cut down the amount of damage that you cause to your knees over time. That would be my recommendation if, if this is your choice, but I do want you to understand that it's not going to completely stop all the damage. You will pay a price down the road for do, competing with wraps, particularly as strong as you are. It's not going to be a free pass. 
All right, next question. What's your suggested program or programs to run after Bill Star Mad Cows, which is a novice to intermediate program, assuming you are now nearing the end of linear progression and moving into the intermediate advanced stage of lifting? And in your opinion, what numbers uh, should accompany the end of this novice intermediate phase of strength training, bench squat, deadlift? Actually, you need to understand that the Bill Starr program was actually written for NFL players, professional athletes, and college-level athletes originally. It is not, I wouldn't consider it a true novice program by any means, and I wouldn't say that it, it only applies to early intermediate. The Bill Starr's program can carry you into well into the advanced phase. I don't make program recommendations for advanced lifters. If you're an advanced lifter who wants to progress, you need to hire a coach. You need to hire a very good coach to help you progress through the advanced lifting phase because your goal is to become, again, if, if you're stagnated at advanced, then you are an advanced lifter forever. So if you want to push beyond advanced, which is where that will take you, you're trying to become an elite level lifter. You're trying to compete at a very, very serious level, in which case, if you're not qualified to write your own custom programs, you're going to need to branch out and hire a coach. So there is no specific program I recommend. Now, what I would say as far as the Bill Starr's program goes, it's going to depend upon your overall height. Now, some people say body weight, but body weight shouldn't matter because you should have been gaining a lot of muscle. You shouldn't be walking around at six foot tall and 170 pounds if you finish this program it doesn't work that way uh, but I'm gonna say that Bill Starr's program should probably carry you up through being able to do sets of five reps with maybe close to a 300 pound bench it should be able to carry you to where you can do you know a 400 ish squat for five reps and be able to deadlift 500 pounds for five reps that's the strength level of program like that should be able to carry you through and once you hit those sort of numbers then it's time to consider going to a really advanced program but uh, for most guys a program like that should carry you up to about that threshold because that's that's the threshold that it's intended to take you to because that's generally what's going to be expected of say you know sub 300 pound nfl players and things at least at the time the program is written so that's what it's designed to take people to so that's a, a totally reasonable expectation for the program because it was written for um, nfl and college football players in the 80s and 90s to get as big and strong as possible all right next question and this is going to be the last question of the week and this is more of again an off-topic question more of a philosophy question and he asked what do you think about people who work for someone else are they slaves to their bosses are they slaves in a literal sense no of course not because you have the option to quit at any time and go pursue a different line of work the only reason people continue to work at jobs that they really really hate uh, is because they pay enough for them to sustain a lifestyle that they have chosen or they've gotten themselves into. You know, if you go get a job that maybe pays more than a job you might enjoy a little more, then generally you've made that choice because of the financial aspects to it. And then once people lock themselves into a lifestyle and a mortgage and a car note and a family that requires them to maintain that level of pay to maintain the lifestyle that they chose for themselves, then they might feel like a slave and like they're trapped in that job. But in that case, the, that's a personal choice that they have oftentimes made. There are obviously exceptions to that rule with extenuating circumstances, but people have kind of pigeonholed themselves into that to where they must maintain that job to sustain the lifestyle that they chose for themselves. And in that case, they are maybe a slave to their lifestyle, not so much a slave to their boss. And the thing to remember is that oftentimes when you work for yourself, you may actually work harder and put in more effort and sometimes for less money than when you work for someone else. But you work for yourself because you want to feel that freedom of it and because maybe it's more fulfilling to you. And I guess the reality is, look, we live in a world to where we don't have true communism or socialism and we never will the way that people think because in true communist countries generally if you don't work oftentimes historically they've just thrown you away or executed you or found ways to get rid of you you're not just supported by everyone else unless you're really sick or disabled and still historically in some of those countries when those people become a burden they go ahead and just kill them anyways so uh, people have these weird dreams about this we you live in a world to where we have always had to struggle in some way to survive even before there was civilization that's just the nature of reality unless you're just born into wealth and power you're that lucky rare individual so uh, it's not really slavery. You're going to have to do something to survive. And my advice to you is you have to decide at a certain point 
of can you find something that you enjoy doing enough that it makes you feel fulfilled as a person and you have personal fulfillment in some way doing the things that you need to do to make a living to survive, in which case that's not going to feel like slavery. But the thing is, work is not slavery. Work has been a necessity to survive forever. Even a wild animal out in the wild has to work to survive generally. You know, if a tiger doesn't hunt down and stalk and catch its prey to eat, he starves to death. That's not slavery. That's called survival. That's just the, the reality of nature in the world that we live in. So your best bet is to find something that you enjoy enough that it's not going to feel like true work to you at the end of the day, that you're going to get a sense of fulfillment from it as you earn your living and earn your way to survive. And if you find something that maybe pays you more and gives you a lifestyle that you want that you hate what you do for a living, that is a choice that you made at some point to fall into that when you chose that lifestyle. And that's just the price that you have to pay for that. And you accept it and you live with it. But this whole idea of, of work being slavery in any sort of social setting is far from true because the reality is it frees you from a lot of the real risk and dangers of, of the nature of life. And, and the truth is, in the modern society we live in, we have so many opportunities to make a living doing different things, way more than we have in many parts of history, that honestly, if you really want to bad enough, you can find something you enjoy doing and make a living doing it. Uh, there are ways out there. You just have to want to find them. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.